evening subcommittee meeting. My name is Councillor Steve Race. I'll be chairing this evening's meeting. Uh, the meeting will be recorded. It's been live streamed on YouTube. Councillors taking part in voting this evening are present here in the chamber. Um, if any committee members are accessing this meeting remotely, the reminder that not council has been present for the purposes of the Local Government Act 1972, and they may not vote on any items under consideration. At the discretion of the chair, myself, you may, however, contribute to the discussion and participate in a non-decision-making capacity. Welcome to any members of the public and press who join us this evening at this meeting. And for anyone joining the meeting remotely via Google Meet, there's a chat function. However, please only use this to raise IT-related issues. As chair of this subcommittee, I will not be monitoring it. Meeting participants are reminded to turn their mobile phones off or put them on silent, please. And also, please note that any persistent disruptive behavior will result in you being asked to leave the meeting. In the event of an internet outage, we'll adjourn the meeting and then come back and continue once it's resolved. Firstly, I'll turn to my fellow planning committee members and ask them to please introduce themselves. I'll start with Councillor John Narcos in the corner. Uh, Councillor Narcos. Councillor Webb. Michael Desmond, Councillor Hackney Downs Ward. Councillor Crowdwood, Springfield Ward. Great, thank you very much. Um, there are various council officers present at this meeting uh, this evening, both in the room and joining us remotely, including um, the following. So, um, for you might note that agenda item five has been uh, withdrawn from the meeting agenda, so we only have a substantive item agenda six. Uh, we'll be led on that by the designated planning officer, James Clark. Um, we've got lead planning officers in attendance. We've got assistant director of planning and building control, Natalie Broughton. Uh, to my left, we have development manager, um, John Sang. Uh, to my right, we have Gareth Sykes, the governance services officer. We have Christine Stevenson, our legal services officer. And we've got Mario uh, Caraman online who deals with our ICT. Some of you joining us this evening will have contacted Gareth, the governance officer in advance this meeting to register to speak. Objectors, the applications and representatives, the applicants are also in attendance. Before we continue, I'll briefly outline how the meeting will proceed. We'll hear each planning application in turn, summarized by the planning officer. We'll then have a, a five-minute statement from objectors followed by a five-minute statement from the applicant. If there's more than one speaker from an applicant or an objector, they will have to agree amongst themselves before and how they'll split that five-minute speaking time. Members of the planning subcommittee will then be free to ask questions of the planning officers, objectors, or the applicants. And in my role as chair of the planning subcommittee, I'll ensure that members have everything they need to make a decision, that objectors and applicants have the opportunity to set up their case, and that the meeting runs properly. I will not be taking any contributions from the floor. You must have given notice to the governance officer before the meeting to register to speak. The deadline for registering to speak was 4 p.m. yesterday, and the speaker's list is now closed. Subcommittee so members are not representing either their wards uh, nor their political parties, and members will make decisions on the basis of site visits that they've made, what we've read in the published application report, and of course, what we hear this evening. We must make any decision on an application in accordance with the Council's development plan, including the Council's local plan LP33 and the London plan unless relevant material planning considerations indicate otherwise. Subcommittee members are reminded not to take into account or discuss non-material planning matters, and when taking a decision, members should not have allowed themselves to prejudge any application prior to this meeting. And similarly, if a member has any interest related to an application on the meeting agenda, they must consider whether that interest ought to be disclosed, and where appropriate, they must withdraw from the meeting while the application is discussed and voted upon. When we've finished our deliberations on a planning application, I'll read out the recommendation as set out in the published application report, and the members will vote on the recommendation by raising their hand. When the decision is made that is normally the end of the matter for this subcommittee, the applicant may appeal our decision and objectors may seek legal redress. I advise you to seek legal advice in either case. And, excuse me. And finally, depending on how the meeting this evening progresses, we may take a short break at around eight o'clock. Uh, we'll now go to the published meeting, uh, meetings order business, beginning with item one. Apologies for absence, uh, Gareth. Yeah, Chair, just before I get on to the list of members giving apologies, a slight correction, and I should have corrected your opening statement. Um, obviously, because we've got two councillors, one speaking in objection and one speaking for, uh, both sides this evening speaking have 15 minutes between them, so it's, yeah. But um, on, on to the other point, uh, apologies for absence. Uh, Councillor Levy has given his apologies, but obviously Councillor Crowdford is, um, is attending uh, as a substitute member. Uh, and Councillor Young is obviously speaking in objection. Uh, Councillor Potter has given her apologies, and Councillor Joseph 
has also given her apologies and her as well. Ali Sadek as well. Oh, um, thank, thank you very much. Chair, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we'll uh, move on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Um, do any of the committee members have any declarations of interest they'd like to uh, make public? No, thank you very much. Um, sorry, Chair, just on a point of accuracy. Oh, we all know Councillor um, Councillor Young and Councillor Steinberger who were speaking in objection and in support, and respectively, because you're all obviously fellow cabinet councillors. Great, thank you. Um, item three, uh, to consider any proposals, questions uh, referred to the committee. Anything for us? No, Chair. Great, thank you very much. And then for approval or otherwise, we have minutes of the last meeting or pre of a previous meeting, which is pre-application meeting on 13th of November. Any comments on those minutes? Could you note them if not? Agree them, note them, either or, don't care. Um, in indicate your assent in uh, some way. Ideally, I'd like them agreed, please. Agreed, great. Thank you very much. That's fine. No, worries. thank you very much. Um, as we've discussed, item five is withdrawn, so we move on to item six. Um, so, James, you're presenting. Um, John, could we get the lights, please? Is that right? Thank you. Uh, item six is 42 Burkholt Crescent uh, in North Hackney. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, Members. The committee case relates to a planning application for the construction of a single-storey rear extension at ground floor level, first floor infill extension and a rear extension, as well as the installation of windows and side elevation, excavation of a full-depth basement and an associated front light well. Members should note the published addendum, which includes minor amendments to the development description to remove the reference to a rear light well, corrections to the rear elevation, and an amended daylight sunlight assessment, along with additional comments that have been received from the uh, the public um, after the public of the uh, after the publication of the officer's report. The site is located to the north of Burghall Crescent between Cranwich Road and Durley Road. This is not located in a conservation area and it does not relate to a listed building. You can see out there outlined in red. The application site relates to a three-story end of terrace single dwelling house built from red stock brick okay, a cursor there but that's the dwelling house in question to the rear the dwelling house benefits from a rear outrigger whilst at the roof level the dwelling house features a double pitched roof above the main part of the dwelling house and a pitched roof above the outrigger a hipped roof above the outrigger the dwelling house previously featured numerous rear extensions at the ground floor level although these are no longer present on site the application site is of a similar typology to the other dwelling houses in the terrace. Notably, there are only numerous examples of large ground floor rear extensions on the neighboring dwelling houses. They've just gone off. I'll wait for it to come back on. There are also several examples of rear roof extensions, both on the terrace application site forms a part of. See there? and the terrace just across the road on the other side of Burghall Crescent. As the site is an end of terrace dwelling house property, the property, end of terrace property, it would adjoin dwelling houses to the west along which along Cranwich Road, which is shown here. These are the properties along Cran on the west, on the eastern side of Cranwich Road. It is the existing plans here. You can see the existing proposed basement plans. The proposed plans show the proposed basement, as well as the front light well and the subterranean space beneath the front garden. These spaces would be used as a play space, office space, and plant storage. This element is considered to be acceptable in terms of design and standard of accommodation, and a condition has been recommended to offset any drainage impacts. Further to this, we can see a previous consent from application 2021-0544, showing a basement of a similar size, showing that this features already benefits from plan permission in part. The existing proposed ground floor plans show the front light well, which has already been discussed, as well as the rear extension at the back of the site. See here the proposed plans. 
Similarly, these elements of the proposal already benefit from plan permission from application 2021-0544. So again, this is a previous application where the one I just showed you, but that was the basement plans. These are the ground, uh, the roof plans. You can see a similarly large extension, which is already approved. Can I ask that you speak really slowly oh. so that we can all hear just the acoustics of it? Yeah, and don't interrupt again, please, Councillor Young. Thank you. The existing and proposed first floor plans show the addition of the first floor infill extension. This is the room with two beds in the top right corner of the house. So these are the existing again, and these are the first floor plans. You can see that there's an infill extension at the first floor level, and that is in the top corner there where those two beds are shown. First floor extension of a similar design, scale, and appearance was approved as part of application 2019-1633. You can see on the rear elevation there and the side elevations, the infill between the outrigger wall, the side out wall of the outrigger, and the side rear elevation of the dwelling house. The second floor will be enlarged by the addition of a rear roof extension. Then the second floor plans existing and proposed here should be enlarged. Um, as you can see from the roof plans, this roof extension will wrap around the slopes of the rear roof and the outrigger roof so the existing and proposed. Include a sucker roof above as well. The proposed rear roof extension will be similar in scale and appearance to a rear roof extension, which was deemed to be permitted development on the application 2018-2033. So these are the plans from that previous application. On the existing proposed side elevations, you can see the proposed windows and doors in the side elevation. This is the existing the proposed There's five windows at the ground floor level one door and two windows above. A similar, proposal, a similar proposal has already been approved under application 2019-2189. Again, this is another lawful development certificate which found these works to be permitted development. These are the existing and proposed, these are the existing front and rear elevations, as you can see. And then these are the proposed front and rear elevations. You can see all the works proposed included here. So the, in front, the ground floor extension, the first floor extension, the front right well. So it's gone off again, bad, bad timing. But And also the roof extension, you'll see when it comes back on. So these are the overview of all the works included in this application. Officers are satisfied that given the scale of the works, have already been approved on site, as well as the other de development on the neighbouring sites, that the proposed development will not be out of character with the area. Furthermore, the development will not ha will have no adverse impact upon neighbouring immunity and conditions have been attached to ensure that any harmful impacts are offset. Officers therefore recommend this application for approval subject to the conditions outlined in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, great. So we have in objection, we've got um, Clyde. Yes. Um, good morning. Um, good evening, Chair. Good evening, members. Do you mind if I quickly clarify one of the points that James, the case officer, made in terms of the addendum? Do you mind getting the rear elevation up so it's clear? Um, just, to be, um, just to reiterate a point that we've had discussions on, um, the previous iteration that we published showed an annotation of 2.8 metres at the height of the boundary. Um, this well, Early today, we basically did some scale measurements of it, and it turned out to be 3 metres. So we've got a revised rear elevation where the correct scale reflects what the annotation of 2.8 metres is, is at the boundary. Because of that, we didn't reconsult because we didn't feel that it would prejudice um, any material planning in, um, considerations which will be seen tonight. So the overall scale and height of the extension remains the same. It's just a factual correction in terms of the scale of the rear extension. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's a bit of feedback in this room. I'm not sure why. Um, in objection, we have Clyde Williams. Yeah, thank you. Um, Clyde, it um, says here you have 10 minutes. Um, 
think that might have been a mistake. Um, but um, it, it is because you've got one speaker on either side, so you don't have to reallocate to the other side because you, but we've said 10 minutes, so you can take 10 minutes, um, up to 10 minutes, okay? And you're welcome to uh, start whenever you like. Hello, good evening, everyone, and um, thank you for my 10 minutes, although I might need all of that. I must, I must thank the the officers. I must praise the officers for their for their diligence and the way they've actually gone about this work. Uh, there are many examples of of planning applications on the same property that has been refused based on the the extent of the size of the developer. Um, also, it was, it's been stated that it's unsymp unsympathetic to um, the dwellings, the neighboring dwellings. Also, it's stated about light and the loss of light and, um, in, and increased sense of enclosure. I'm actually the next door neighbor at number 40. And in going through the application, it seems to me that a lot of it is based on the false assumption that there's a wall between number 42 and number 40. As part of the part of the proposals, you will see a wall that is supposed to exist. In fact, what has happened in that during during um, COVID. All of a sudden, there were some people coming into the gardens to actually erect a wall, which I, which I complained about. I actually raised it with um, the local authority, and I was told that um, you would be better off taking your own legal, legal steps to actually remove the wall, because as I'm a local authority, we could actually, um, we could, we could legislate against it, but it would take a long time in actually getting it in actually getting it resolved, and it would be quicker for you to actually take legal advice and actually get that sorted out yourself. As a result of fifteen thousand pounds later spending on um, a lawyer, the the wall came down. So, in in the application, it actually says there is a, there is a wall, um, but in fact. It is a false wall that never really existed. There's also a very clever. There's also a very clever paper within within the submission, which actually talks about the the impact of light on um, on on neighboring properties. Now I'm not sure when this when this paper was actually done, but if you were to if you were to be sat in my garden when that wall was up and um, the uh, and um, the sun was setting actually in the west you would see the impact how my the, the light in my garden was actually almost removed completely so i i'm not sure how that 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 proposal that was made in terms of um, we've done an assessment of lights with regards to how that is going to impact on the neighbors. Um, it certainly impacted, and it certainly will will have an impact, a significant impact on my property. And the, the third point, the third point, is around there's some. Um, Roof roof terracing that will be made, and um, I see the the um, officers are said that that will not be used uh, as as a, a means of people accessing it. I wonder how how will we enforce that? How will we make sure that if this structure is put up, that it will not be used for those purposes? Because as it is. It seems to me that my that my garden will be will be will be overlooked, and there'll be significant loss in terms of privacy. Now, I 
I understand that there's a lot of building that is going on and people actually need actually some more space. But it seems to me that the proposal as it is, is not, is, is not, sim is not sympathetic with my property as um, a neighbor. And I would love to live peacefully with my neighbor and I would love for us to find a way of actually them doing their developments without it negatively impacting on my space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Clyde. Um, Councillor Sarian, you've got uh, five, up to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Could we go back to the photo of the terrace, which shows the front of the houses in Bughole? Oh, now it's gone off. <laughs> If it comes back um thank you so that that picture there shows the front of this particular property but i think there's another one that shows the whole of the terrace and the reason i wanted to have a look at that or you to have a look at that's the back yeah there's the front so i wanted to show members of the subcommittee that's it brilliant thank you um how this terrace looks at the moment from the front so one of the um one of the points made in the application by officers is that this terrace has already had quite a number of basements, significant sized basements um, dug out, and also quite a number of um, roof terraces and other adjustments, significant adjustments to the buildings. This terrace is, I would say, and I'm no expert, a pretty classic example of a late Victorian terrace. It is unspoilt from the front. Um, this property is the end property on the terrace, so there is a different view from that end property than you get from any of the middle. So anything you do in the back garden of that terrace, anything built in the back garden of that terrace, will be visible from the side for anybody walking into Burkholt Crescent. Um, so I've been asked to come on behalf of quite a number of residents who are neighbours of um, 42 Burkholt Crescent, so people living in that street, the neighbouring streets, um, as well as on behalf of Mr. Williams, who's the next door neighbour. I hope you've all had a chance to read this fairly significant and in-depth objections that neighbours have put in, many of which are not relevant planning um, considerations, but some of which are, and also had a chance to look at the history uh, that sits behind this application, that this building has um, is not in a great state at the moment, and I don't think anybody suggests that um, building works and improvements to this building shouldn't be made. They clearly should. It needs some work. There's no question it needs some work. Um, there are three things that I wanted to just draw your attention to in looking at this. The first is the, the sheer size of the basement extension proposed and the sort of wraparound nature of it, that it's just too big. Second is the rear roof extension. Of course, it's not a material planning matter, whether it might be used for some other purpose at some later point, but just the, the impact of that roof, the impact of that roof extension um, on the appearance of the building, but particularly on the neighbour, um, is quite significant. And the third is the, the impact of light on the light of the neighbouring buildings particularly on Mr. Williams' um, home. So there's quite a lot of paperwork in this application, and I just wanted to draw your attention to the daylight and sunlight assessment. So daylight and sunlight assessments are a bit of a mystery to me. So when I had a read of this, I looked at, at what, the, what the relevant law is, what they're actually looking at, what they're required to look at. Um, and the... Uh, it's page, I don't know what page it is, but in page 81, um, that there aren't any specific national planning policies relating to prospective impacts of developments on daylight and sunlight on their surrounding environment. Okay. Uh, and secondly, at 14, but the BRE report site layout planning for daylight and sunlight a guide to good practice is the established national guidance that we're looking at here there's nothing in this report 
that is my sound going on and off? In a weird way, it's just to me. There's nothing in this report that suggests that there will be no impact on the light of the neighboring properties. What the report says is it's not unlawful impact. So when you look at the, um, you look at the methodology here, it makes, seconds. it makes clear that the, it's only those windows which face due south which need to be assessed for sunlight. What Mr. Williams is saying is that the, the, there will be an impact on his property of the reduction in light of this significant roof terrace and significant wraparound basement. And you can see that from the table in this report. There's about a 15% reduction, actually. So it's not that... Time? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Young. Uh, and then in support, um, we have... Presumably, um, we would go with the applicants themselves first rather than the councillor. Gareth? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, it's the other way around. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think I've listed that incorrectly. Unless Councillor Feinberg um, doesn't mind that the applicants go speak first. Great. So we have um, Shulam Posen and Moses Rosner uh, first, before, and then Councillor Simchi Steinberger afterwards, if that's all right. So you've got um, 10 minutes, uh, Mr. Posen and Mr. Rosner, between you. Um, I suppose if you want to do it the other way around, I'll accept that if you want to do that. Sorry, are Mr. Posner and Mr. Rosner ready to speak? Yep, so 10 minutes between the two of you. Are you splitting it or? Great, perfect. Okay, whenever you're ready, thank you. I, yeah. Oh, it's on now. Yeah, thanks. Good evening. Um, um, a few, just about three points I would like to run through quickly. James has already run through the application very professionally. I just want to highlight two things. This application is a combination of four previous applications. Two of them, LDCs, which are lawful development certificates, mean relying on permitted development rights. Two of those are planning permissions. Just to put this into context, the roof extension is a permitted development roof extension. The side windows are permitted development uh, permission, which is on the class A of part one. Um, the other two are planning applications. One is for the ground floor and basement. And the other one is for the first floor extension. To put things in context, the LDC applications could be built out at any time at any day. The GPDO is not changed. They can still be implemented as they are. Turning to the two planning applications, the ground floor and basement application were granted on the 3rd of June, 2021. That application is still extant, and there's no material difference between the current proposal in terms of the ground floor and basement. So basically, the ground floor and basement are still extant and can be built out tomorrow. The first floor extension is granted in 2019, but it has been implemented because the wall has been taken out where the first floor is going to sit. So basically, that extension is also extent. So in my mind, all four developments can be built out at one time without any further ado. But as is normal in planning practice, when people go to develop a house in order to be able to do all the works at one go and feel safe, you usually submit an application which includes all the approved works. You get in the builder and it's done in one, in one go and you're comfortable, you've got your planning for your end result, you can show your bank, your mortgage, this is the end result, this is the planning, this is what I've built. But in other words, whatever is applied for could be built out in any event. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two, just to add on that, that in fact the first floor extension currently applied for is, for is slightly smaller than the one approved. The one previously approved goes up to the rear line. The one currently proposed is about 20 centimeters stepped in, so it's more subordinate to the one previously approved. Um, in terms of the side windows, again, anything built under permitted development rights at ground floor level do not have to be obscure windows, only at first floor level. In this case, it is proposed that even the ground floor windows will also be obscure windows. 
that means that the application is actually an enhancement for neighbors com in compared to the LDC proposal. So that's one point. Point number two, I will turn to uh, the comments being made before. Um, in fact, because I've already explained that the application is extent, I do not really have to address those points made because the development can go ahead in any event. But out of respect, I think I should address the points made. Uh, the wall mentioned whether it was built or removed, I don't think is relevant to this case in any event. It was not a planning reason why it was removed. It was a party wall reason why it was removed. That wall was built in order to implement the prior approval. It was built without party wall agreement, as far as I understand. It was removed in any, when, any event. We're not relying on that prior approval because there's a planning permission which is still extent. In terms of light, there is the guidance used in planning of the BRE, which in fact allows up to a 20% reduction. So not only is the planning application extent, planning permission extent the previous one, there is, it allows, BRE allows a reduction of 20%. The roof terrace has seen no reason to suspect that it will be used as a roof terrace. In any event, a condition is imposed in that respect. Um, number three, I just want to turn to conditions. Quickly, just to clarify two points. I note, just to highlight this, that paragraphs 17.5 and 17.6 are mistakenly a repetition of 17.3 and 17.4, so they need to be deleted. Just a, a typographical mistake. Uh, there is condition window details, which it's not a conservation area, but I would accept such a condition. But turning to condition obscure glazing, I don't think it's necessary because the plans specifically state that the windows will be obscured. So I don't think that there should be a condition requiring submission and approval of the obscure glazing to be used if the windows are in any event going to be approved, the details of the windows. So I would agree that there should be a condition to say that the window should be obscure, but I do not think the details of the of the obscure windows should be a separate submission as to the details of the windows in 17, in paragraph 17.7. Um, I think that's it, which I would like to say. Thanks very much. Great, you've got four minutes left. So are you, are you happy to end there or um, Mr. Rosner, do you have anything to add? All fine, okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Steinberger, you have um, five minutes. Max five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to uh, grab a few points on this particular application. Um, I was actually there yesterday, probably for, I'm quite regular on that road in any case, and you may not have any uh, or not much support letters in for this application, but when I was walking down the road, I actually spoke to a lot of residents there who actually were strongly supporting this application, but we're actually shocked that it's even come to committee because they know that all these applications have been approved prior already. So they didn't bother to write in. If, the, if it's obviously necessary for the committee, I could give you the addresses, but I, I, I believe it's irrelevant for now. Uh, furthermore, we're talking about the layout of the road. We leave out what's actually also in the road. Any person going down Burkle Crescent Towards the end of Virgil Crescent, there's actually buildings which have completely nothing to do with the whole setup or layout of the road. It doesn't show on any of the pictures. Uh, I think it's one from both sides. You've got a building 1C, which is actually a block of flats, three flats on one side. On the other side, there's a house completely different to the whole layout of that road. And bearing in mind, this is also an end of terrace. So I know I shouldn't really have to even bring this in because all these, applic all these applications have already been gone through and have already been approved. But I think it's important to bring to the committee's attention that that road has actually, the, the, the whole road is not the same layout at all. And I also think it's important the committee should know that it's not a conservation area. That road is not a conservation area. 
an effect where I live near me is a building site and where the building ten times more than by me uh, than by this particular application and uh, it wasn't necessary at all to come to committee and this black the consultant said there's planning laws and I think you know the planning laws should be in all roads Burkle Crescent is no different to Portland Avenue I mean take an example of Rookwood Road where you've got an end of terrace building where the houses are ten times more than because there was nothing different in Rookwood Road before that building and the council approved there the first building number two which is a complete different building to the whole road so I think we have to be consistent on what we're doing so I don't think Burkle Crescent is different in planning laws planning laws is for all the roads in Hackney so I just wanted to bring this to the attention of the committee and again I say I was there I saw the house and all these all these applications here they've already been approved and I think it's important it's important that they all know this and I believe the work is also you know the work has been carried out for this approval so I'm a little bit coming here today I'm like a little bit thinking I really don't know what I'm coming here for because it's all been approved prior so I just wanted to make it very clear thank you chair okay thank you very much um great okay um I thought it might just be worth um officers we've had some um Obviously, this this is an application that has had previous applications um, approved. My understanding is that some some of the details are different, but largely this is a a new application, but uh, um, but uh, incorporating previous applications that have been approved. Is that correct? Uh, yes, in, in in a way, yes. The some of the elements of this application are somewhat different, slightly different. So I could talk through how there's some slight variations as well. Is that right? I don't think you need to talk through variations, that's fine, as long as we know it's broadly the same, but there are differences, and so it's a new application um, that, um, uh, that um, councillors need to, need to um, decide on. That's fine. Thank you, Jones. Great, okay. Um, councillors, questions? Want to go on? Yeah, Councillor Desmond first. Welcome, Councillor Steinberger. It's nice to see you with the committee here. Uh, I know Burj Al Crescent very well, and uh, I'm surprised it's not in a conservation area. It's a lovely road. I believe in the 1980s it was used for filming to show that extraordinary Victorian character that we have and is so often um, affected by, by things that happen here. Uh, I'd like to ask the officer, broadly speaking, there are aspects of this that could affect the aesthetics of the road. Will the roof appear significantly different in terms of the materials roof? Do we know what materials will be uh, used? And if you were to look at it as you go into Burgos Crescent, would the amenity change because of this extension? Sure, I believe we have, um, we do have a condition about matching materials. So if the roof extension is approved, we will have a sort of condition to make sure that the, the materials it's built from do match the materials of the existing. The idea will be for to match. Um, yeah, it would be side hung slates, which would be aimed to match the existing. Um, the roof extension would be slightly visible. One thing to note that we have changed from the development application in order to make sure in order to ensure that this application complies with our alterations and extensions SPD is that we have asked for them to set the roof extension back from the uh, party walls on either side by approximately 0.3 meters uh, as is standard for our uh, requirement from our SPD when there are larger roof extensions nearby so you can sort of see from the roof extension here so that should slightly re reduce the visual prominence also, this roof extension is slightly higher than the um, permitted development one that was approved. However, it's still set down by one meter from the ridge line, which is considered to be fairly substantial by us. So we're fairly satisfied that like this extension would not be harmful to the sort of the wider area um, and is sort of fairly compliant with what is uh, our SPD and our guidance, what we would allow. Also, it's worth noting that there are, there's an example already of like at least one larger Mansa uh, rear roof extension in the terrace and also there's another one on the other side of the road as well so there are precedents you could say that have in the area 
for the development. Hold on, can I just ask the applicant, when this goes ahead, if we give it permission, will the whole house be refurbished to the same standard as well as the um, extension that you're applying to? Yes, definitely. Keep it the same. Uh, as I move in with my with my four kids and looking to grow the family, so we're looking to have a, um, a big, large house and we'll keep it at the same. Right. Thank you. Can I just remind councillors that that's not a material planning consideration? So thanks very much. Um, other um, questions, Councillor Narcos? <laughs> Um, just a question on sort of the, the scale and the massing. Obviously, the, uh, Mr. Mr. Williams, um, the objector, sort of is concerned about this, the scale of this. This is a very large extension. Um, part of the justification for that has been given that there are um, already properties on the road in the terrace who have had similar sized extensions. Obviously, they're not on the end. I was just wondering what what the the fact that this property is an end of terrace um, and has that kind of side view that the other properties don't necessarily have. What, what sort of, you know, how that sort of factors into decisions about the sort of the acceptable nature of the scale of massing? Sure. So there's multiple different elements of this application. Elements such as the ground floor rear extension is a look at the ground floor and it's at the rear, so that should reduce its visual prominence from the surrounding area. Probably the most visible element of the proposal would be the first floor infill extension. But again, um, it's worth noting that already has a plan permission that's already been approved previously as part of the 2019 one. Um, although that permission possibly has elapsed now, it's still worth noting that our policies haven't changed and therefore a certain application be submitted that like that, we'd have to, uh, we'd be happy to accept it again. It's also worth noting that this application is somewhat changed in scale in terms of what is, I'll just put the side options here. Previously, it's, you can see the, uh, the infill extension is slightly set back from the rear elevation of the outrigger. That's actually a change from what was originally um, approved in the previous application. So that is done in order to sort of emphasize that this is a later addition and is to emphasize the subservience to the host dwelling house and retain that original feature. So although that may be slightly visible from the, from the street view, it's not considered to be a substantial an, um, alteration that will change the character of the dwelling house or the wider area. Can I just add an addendum to Councillor Narcos's question, just in terms of the size and scale of the basement dig out? Um, what, where does that fall within policy? Uh, is it something um, that's allowed? It tends to be controversial in other places in London occasionally. Sure, typically we're happy to support um, basement extensions. The sort of main applications that we add are usually design, which in this case is just a front light well. You can see in the section here, so in the section plan. This is actually a feature that already exists on Burke or Crescent. I believe there's uh, two properties further down which already have a similar feature. And again, this is a feature that has been approved as part of previous applications as well. Um, the other consideration we have is um, a standard of accommodation. So basically a requirement to ensure that all um, rooms benefit from sufficient light and outlook. Here you can see the rooms that relate to this application are a study, a playroom, and also if on the left-hand side of, this, of the drawing here, when it returns, you better see there's a plant room. None of these rooms are considered what we would call habitable rooms. So that's normally something like a bedroom or a kitchen or a dining room or a living room, rooms that people spend most of their time. Um, we don't consider, therefore, that these rooms have the same sort of requirements for standard of accommodation in terms of light and outlook that you would normally have for those kind of rooms. It's similar to how if you had like a cinema room in your house, you wouldn't be required to provide that. We have the same approach towards like a large playroom like that. And the last consideration is impact on drainage. So um, we've decided with that in regards to that, that um, we can offset that impact of condition. There's a standard um, groundwater condition that will be attached in that in the event of approval requires a report to sort of show the impact of that element. Thank you. Um, questions? Further questions? No? I've got a few at the back for me. So um, there seems to be some disagreement about a wall in the back. Um, do we know what the disagreement is and the reality of that? And does it matter? 
I believe the war that you're referring to is the it was a, a large sort of um cinder, cinder block war that was previously there as part of um uh, application that's no longer present on site that is was shown on the existing plans but that's no longer present on site that's all being removed now um the proposal would be to essentially erect a three a six meter deep um 2.8 meter high uh extension well it would be three point two meters high but because it's they're doing site excavation works the actual extension would only have a a, a boundary height of 2.8 meters from 40 burkhold crescent which is something that we've ensured with the revised plans that we obtained recently so essentially that is the yeah from, from our perspective that should be sufficient to ensure a, a sufficient standard of accommodation okay. thanks james Gaff. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just to reiterate the point that part of all matters are not material planning consideration, so that's not something that we've taken account in the assessment of this application. Um, just to reiterate, reiterate the point, sorry, the ground floor extension has two previous permissions, one of which is a prior approval for an identical height. There's also actually a previous consent for a two-storey rear extension which exceeds the parameters to which we're looking at today. I don't know if you want to quickly show that, James, the side elevation. Um, so my point is kind of twofold. Firstly, party wall considerations are not material to our assessment. We assess the planning parameters of what is in front of us, and that is akin to an existing prior approval that's already been granted permission, an existing full planning application, which has also been given planning permission. And there's also another previous consent, which, which relates to a two-story rear extension. So this application that you see in front of you has a lesser impact than something that could be implemented separately. Thank you. Uh, and then just the, there was a conversation about light into the garden. Obviously, um, it's, a, it's an extension, so it's, but it's on the land that's owned by the applicant. Um, what is the impact and how do we judge that? Can you repeat the first part of that question, please? Sorry, light into the uh, neighbouring garden. So in regards to sort of in, the applicant has um, provided the daylight sunlight assessment, which sort of measures the impact of like, daylight and sunlight to the neighbour's garden. Um, Gav, the best one, he's, he's the most familiar with uh, daylight sunlight assessments. But my understanding is the requirement that Bree sets out is it is the garden needs to receive at least 50% uh, of the garden needs to receive two hours of direct sunlight on the 21st of March, and that's what those uh, daylight sunlight assessments are based upon, based upon the one that the applicant has provided, that is still acceptable, and that is, um, the issue demonstrates that. Okay, thank you. And then, concern of the roof terrace. Um, we've had this before, I think. What's the design of the access to the roof terrace? Um, is there, a, is it just a window, is it a, is it a door, is it, a, what's, what is it? As far as we're aware, there is no roof terrace proposed as part of this. This is sort of a standard cautionary condition that we attach to any application whenever there's a flat roof, essentially to ensure that the flat roof of that extension is not used as a roof terrace. It's just a sort yeah. of standard condition that we have. Yeah. So we, we condition against it being used as a roof terrace, that's fine, but is there access onto it? Um, is it? Is there a sort of patio door? Is it just a window that we usually... It would be a window you can see on the... Uh, Real elevations, um, it would yeah. essentially just be that window, but then we've again we've always conditioned to ensure that that isn't the case. Okay, fine, thank you. Um, great, yep, hands on across. Um, just, just on that, um, that flat roof, I've correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like we, we had this once on an application where we we applied, uh, attached a condition that it should be a green roof on that flat roof and then that kind of dealt with the the suds um requirement that's already in there or the the, the the condition that it could a green roof could be one of the one of the options but also kind of alleviated some of the concerns from neighbors that that would be used as a roof terrace because obviously it can't be even the green roof is that something we'd be able to do here yeah, and um, unfortunately there's no scope to secure a green roof because it only relates to major development that's the kind of policy parameter to which we can secure green roofs obviously this is a minor householder application so we don't have any reasonable scope to secure it um just in terms of its use as a terrace as james has already pointed out the case officer sorry it, it's a window so we don't anticipate it will be used as a terrace but any prospective breach we would potentially investigate through our planning enforcement team okay so, um, sorry, yeah, just yeah. add to that as well. Um, we are uh, we're recommending the suds condition, and one of the recommended measures as part of that is a green roof. So, the applicant has to provide one of various measures to sort of offset uh, drainage, and that 
could potentially be one that the applicants willing to explore, but they have a variety of options about how to discharge that drainage condition. So that's also worth noting as well. Gareth, and um, usually it's just things like a water bite, it's water retention and rainwater harvesting. Um, it's a standard condition we use, which is why it cites the potential use of the green roof, but there is a specific policy that says that this development is not of a scale to secure that. So the applicant essentially has a number of options to secure studs measures. Okay. Um, any other questions from councillors? Are you happy to go to a vote then in that case? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the recommendation summary... Um, the young, actually, you probably should have left the room already, I think, because uh, you are a planning committee member. So I, I have to leave the room after I've done something previously. Sorry about that. I should have kicked you out beforehand. Politely, of course. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, you're fine, Councillor Steinberg, because you're not a member of the planning committee. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, the recommendation summary is to grant planning permission subject to conditions. Can all those in favour please raise your hands? Thank you. That's uh, unanimous then in that case. So thank you very much. Thank you for the applicants. Thank you for the objectors for spending your time here this evening. And again, apologies for the delayed start. Um, we move to item seven in that case. Um, so we, um, Gareth, you want to let Sarah know she can come back in and answer young now. Um, delegated decisions. Um, any comments? Otherwise, can we note them? Noted. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't had any other business um, notified to me, to Gareth. Um, just to say the next meeting yep. is on the 7th of February and also we have a pre-application meeting scheduled for the 13th of February. Thank you, Jack. Great. Thank you very much. Um, in that case, that's the close of the meeting. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone online and in particular, Mario. Okay. Um, thank you to officers. Uh, this evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank Safe you. Safe journey home. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Mario.